I, you're not going to find better coverage of the Cincinnati Bengals than you get from Jay Morrison and Paul Diener Jr. And Jay Morrison is kind enough to join us, uh, a proud alum of The Ohio University. He's got the <laughs> athletic uh, pullover on there. He's also from right here in Hamilton, Ohio. So we feel like we, we are kindred spirits with Mr. Jay Morris. Jay, how you doing this morning? I'm great, Tom. How are you? I'm doing all right. Hey, you know, I was talking about your piece before you came on, uh, the one that you wrote that's posted today. Um, I, I, I want to start with this simple question. Um, can the Bengals, because I have people ask me this frequently, and I don't know the answer. Can the Bengals keep Joe Burrow, T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, and I'm talking about long-term now, can they keep all three of those guys and still have a good team? Uh, yeah, I think they can uh, for the immediate future, for sure. It, once you get maybe, I don't know, 2025, 2026, 2027, then it gets dicey because the the, the whole thing, the misconception with Joe Burrow going to be signing this um, this huge extension this offseason is that the rookie contract window is shut, and that's not the case. The way they structure these, I mean, he's due to make eleven point nine million this year. He signs for say two forty, two fifty million, whatever it is. It, it, it's probably only going to go up to about fifteen million this year, maybe nineteen twenty million in twenty twenty four, and then you see the huge hit up in the thirty forty million dollars that following year. That's that's an assumption, but that's the way most of these contracts are structured. That's what the Bills are going to be dealing with this year. With Josh Allen, he's coming on to the third year of that huge deal, and they're going to have to make some tough decisions. So with with T eligible for an extension this year, that's another misconception out there. He's not a free agent. He's mm -hmm. still under a contract. Well, he came in that same draft class with Joe, so they're both going into their fourth year. He's eligible for an extension this year. Um, Jamar Chase still has two years on his rookie deal. He'll be eligible for an extension next year. Um, they... It depends on T, basically, is this this whole thing. I think they could do it. They could structure it that way. This team has been so good at uh, – nobody hits a bats a 1,000 in the draft, but they've been really good about the, the, the way they've drafted lately. And I know some people are going to point to certain picks, Jackson Carmen, some other ones that have not panned out. But overall, they've done a really good in the, job in the draft, done a really good job in free agency of not just going out and paying the highest – one or two guys on the board, but getting five or six of those middle guys and then really mining the gems, the, the Eli Apples and, and the B.J. Hills, which they, they traded for. But they, they find these guys that kind of can come in with a chip on their shoulder that they like and they develop into something better than what they're actually paying them. Um, my, I, I'm sorry, I'm being long with this answer, but my question with, with T and with Jamar uh, – can't does he he said he sees himself as a number one receiver well you're not going to get paid as a number one receiver if you're going to stick around with jamar chase your entire career it, you're not going to get targeted like a number one receiver if you're going to be playing with jamar chase your whole career or say through a second contract so that's the decision t higgins has to make is is he willing to take a little less everybody's talking about joe joe burrow maybe taking a little less to keep these guys around is t higgins willing to sign for a little bit less than what a number one receiver would would make. We, we see this all the time. We saw it with Tyreek Hill last year. Mm -hmm. Chiefs couldn't afford to keep the best, the highest paid wide receiver, the highest paid quarterback. They had to let him go. Packers had to let Devontae Adams go. It's, they are hard decisions to make. Um, the, the Bengals are, have been so financially responsible. They've put them in themselves in a position where they can do this if they want, but you're going to have to hit on a lot of things around them to stay good and keep those guys in place. Explain to me, Jay, uh, because I, I, I just don't understand this. Maybe I should. Not the brightest bulb in the room. Um, what is the big deal about a guy being franchised? It, it, it almost seems like there's some sort of black cloud that hangs over a player if, if they're you know under the franchise tag. I mean, in T. Higgins' case is a perfect example, and he's the one I'm talking about specifically. Uh, you point out he's not a free agent at the end of the year. They could tag him. Now, he would be disappointed he didn't get a long-term deal, but he would also make an enormous amount of money. He'd be paid like a number one guy if he got a franchise tag. What's the big deal about being franchised? It's, 
it's delaying that huge payday. And I know, yes, I mean, you had Jesse Bates this year, what, $12.9 million on the franchise tag. But these guys work so hard, and they know that their window is so small in the NFL that, that a, lot, a lot of people don't stick around that long in the league. And so you finally hit free agency, and you're looking to go out and test your worth on the open market and, and sign a life-changing deal, a multi-year, multi-million dollar deal, and the team puts a franchise tag on you and takes that opportunity away from you. You don't get to see what other people value you as, at least for another year. Um, you, you don't get that long term. It's a one year deal. A lot of play. I mean, first of all, the players, this is in the CBA. So the players agree to this. They don't like it, but their leadership agreed to it. But that's the big part of it. And, and you know, A.J. Green was not happy at all when the Bengals franchise tagged him a few years ago. But like he said, my wife would kill me if I turned down $18 million. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're not going to say, same with Jesse Bates this year. He threatened to sit out. He was never going to sit out. You can't turn down $12.9 million guaranteed dollars. So um, the, the number just keeps going up. Uh, I think it's right around 20 for a wide receiver this year. It's probably going to be north of 20 next year. C could the Bengals do that? Absolutely. I mean, you, you guarantee T. Higgins to stay around for another year feasibly. I mean, he could sit out. He could hold out. Um, it caused a lot of ripples, it, but that's what it is. The players just, they, they see it as, I don't know if it's a sign of disrespect, but they just see it as a way of the, the team having a control over them just when they thought they were going to break free of that control and see what they're worth on the open market. All right, we know uh, whether it's, you know, style of play, whether it's contract negotiations, it's a copycat league. Should be a copycat mm -hmm. league. If somebody out there is doing something well, why wouldn't you want to give it a go, right? So... Mm -hmm. When I sat and watched the Super Bowl, to me, the thing that stood out was each team's offensive line. Chris Jones was a non-factor in that game. Invisible. After, after yeah. just, just completely blowing up uh, the Bengals in the AFC Championship game. Obviously, this you know, 70 sack defense of Philadelphia could not get near uh, Patrick Mahomes. He wasn't sacked one time in the game. Uh, you, you mentioned Tyreek Hill. He leaves. But the Chiefs keep their quarterback. They keep their tight end. They bring in some other guys to kind of piecemeal the thing together on offense, but they throw a ton of money in the offensive line. I preface all of that because in your piece today where you, you, you specifically looked at the draft. So you brought up the three positions. Correct me if I'm wrong. I just read it a little while ago. Tight end, offensive line, wide receiver. Let's start with the idea when you look at the Bengals and you know the issues they have on the offensive line, even with overhauling the whole thing last year, um, why would they choose anything else but an offensive lineman for this draft? Or are they just going, is it possible, they just go all in on offense? I don't know about all in on offense because they actually, they only, Hayden Hurst is the only offensive starter that's not due back, who's hit free agency. On the defensive side, you've got Jesse Bates, Von Bell, Jermaine Pratt. You've got bigger holes to address on the defensive side. So I don't see them going all offense by any means. But you're right. I think offensive tackle is the most likely direction to go. The reason they wouldn't do that in the first round is if a bunch of them fly off. And then you're left with a guy that's got a second round grade that you're they're not going to reach. And they've always been a, a best player available type of mindset. And a lot of teams say that, that sometimes when it comes down to it, they, they don't follow that because sometimes you have to draft for need. And we'll see what happens. They're not going to make a decision. I wouldn't think on Leo Collins before the draft. Um, but I, I do think that he's a, a good candidate to be a cap cut. He's coming into year two of that three year deal he signed last year. But um he, he tore his ACL on Christmas Eve. Yeah. I mean, you don't know if he's going to be ready. And number two, he, he I don't know, he, he was an upgrade, but was he really what they expected at that position? Um, it's hard. It's hard to find offensive linemen in this league. So it would, it would be a tough cut to let go of him. You would have to really feel good about what Jackson Carmen showed you in the, in the postseason, And you would have to feel really good about what you did in the draft. But um, it, it's not just, Collins it's it's Jonah Williams too yeah. I mean he's he's going into the his his fifth year so he's on the fifth year option this he's going to make guaranteed money this year but he'll be a free agent next year is when they drafted him he said hey he's our they said he's our left tackle for the next 10 years I that's I don't 
that's not set in stone now. I'm, I'm not sure he's here beyond this year. I'm not sure even if he is here beyond this year, if he's the left tackle. Maybe they move him to the right side. They've, they've been adamant that, no, he's a left tackle. But if they go get some stud and he outplays him in, in training camp or in OTAs, then maybe that is a possibility. But um, you also, you saw the injuries. This team went 15 games in a row with the same yeah. exact offensive line. And then they started drop, drop, dropping. Uh, the, the one that survived it was Ted Karras, the center, they don't really have a good backup option at center. They've got Trey Hill, who they took late a few years ago, but he the one chance he got to play as a rookie a couple years ago didn't look good. So I don't think you go and back up, you draft a backup interior guy, but that's something I think they will address in middle of this round. But um, I, I do, I think it's tackle in the first round unless they start flying off the board or unless one of those elite guys that they've got a high grade on for some reason slips. Uh, then I could see them pivoting, going in a different direction. You know, as you pointed out in the article, when, when you look at the, the highly ranked tackles and the kid out of Northwestern is by far the highest ranked guy, uh, you know, just up the road in Columbus, you've got two extremely intriguing guys. Mm-hmm. Paris Johnson uh, is a local kid, went to Princeton, uh, but yep. many feel he'll be long off the board, starting left tackle at Ohio State last couple of years after starting his, his career as a guard. Uh, but he is, you know, almost a prototype looking tackle. Uh, great athlete, all those kinds of things. Maybe even more intriguing, though, and it's where you getting back to what you said a moment ago about, you know, maybe a guy's grading in the second round. But it seems like Dewan Jones is a guy that's mm-hmm. really starting now for whatever reason or multiple reasons to really moving up higher and higher. I mean, he is a monster at 6'8", 350, whatever it might be. Um, are those the kind of guys that, that maybe they're looking at? Yeah, I would think so. I mean, anybody that that can play tackle there that is available at 28, I think they would look at. Um, but to your point, you know, if, if that is the case where they go a different direction, I'd be surprised, put it this way, that if they don't have a tackle by the end of the second round. Okay. Um, and so, and Dewan Jones, maybe he's, he's that tweener. Maybe he's a reach at 28, but maybe there's no chance you get him at the end of the second round. So that's where that, that those tough decisions come in. Um, they do like their Ohio State Buckeyes. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, I'll, I'll be the first to, I'm not a film grinder. I, and that one of the great things, and there's a lot of great things about working at The Athletic, but one of the greatest is we have people that do that. And, and um, I, I trust their opinions. And that's why I, that the piece today, and then I'm working on the defensive piece that either come out tomorrow or Monday. Um, I, lean heavily on Dane Brugler, who does a fantastic job. And that's all he does all year long is is watch film. He doesn't cover a team during the season like Paul and I do. So I, I lean on those guys and their opinions. And um, you're right, he's he, Dewan Jones is one of those guys that just kind of just keeps rising and rising. And I can't remember off the top of my head where Dane had him in his top 100. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to say it was in the 50 range. Um, but yeah, that that's a guy that, that you know, if – if he's there in the second round, absolutely pull the trigger. And he's a guy that if if you like him enough, they will they will get a guy like that in the first round if if he's sitting there and a lot of those other big names have gone off the board. Um is there any scenario that you see, just staying with the offensive line for a minute, is there any scenario where you see the Bengals bringing in an Orlando Brown kind of player? In free agency, yeah, no, I, I, I don't think you're you're not going to see this free agent period look like the last two years. I mean, the, all this money going to Joe Burrow and possibly T Higgins and an earmark down the road for Jamar Chase. I just I don't I don't see any way they could make that happen. Um, that that's the that's the big thing with the Burrow deal is they they need to get that done before free agents. They don't have to, but it would it would behoove them to do that because. That's the first domino. Then every, you can make all the other decisions once you know what you've got in terms of a structure with Joe with Joe Burrow's contract. But um, the, even the the Paul had a piece where the, the scouts talked about it. It is not going to look like this is going to be a free agency period where you are looking for bargains in the third wave. Um, they're they're not going to be signing guys on the first day of free agency. Obviously, an Orlando Brown type of guy would be a a yep. huge benefit and a big help for this offensive line. But they Financially, I that I don't see them making work. Okay, you jump to the defensive side of the ball. We know about Bates. We know about Von Bell. We know about Jermaine Pratt. 
those three guys particularly. Eli Apple is also a free agent. Um, yeah. when, when I watch the Bengals play, you said you're not a big you know, film grinder, nor am I. But for me, and, and maybe 99 out of 100 will say, Tom, you're out of your mind. When I watch Jermaine Pratt play and I watch Logan Wilson play, why am I dumbfounded by the idea of, you know, most of the rumbling out there that they have to give Wilson a long-term deal uh, and not Pratt a long-term deal? I, I just don't see in the NFL in this day and age outside of, a you know, most recently, say, a Luke Keekley or maybe a linebacker who's a big pass rusher, somebody like that who's piling up a bunch of sacks. I just don't see the evolution of the league from an offensive standpoint of signing a linebacker to a long-term deal. Is that crazy thinking? Um, it, 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 I mean, linebackers have gone up the way of running backs where they are not near as important as they used to be. I think the whole thing with the Pratt and the Wilson thing, it's, it's asset allocation where right now you have two really good guys. Um, you, we, we talked about all these hard decisions they have to make. Jermaine Pratt. They love everything about him. Uh, what he's been, I, I, he, I feel like he's improved every year that he's been here, playing the best football of his life uh, at the end of last year. But you've got two really good guys there, and you've got hard decisions to make elsewhere. And I, I, I think they're just they're content to to let Jermaine go test the open market. Maybe he doesn't get what he thought he would get out there, and somehow returns. I don't see that being a reality, but it, it's a possibility. But then you just kind of kick the can down the road and you, you, you know, maybe draft another guy this year. You see how Akeem Davis Gaither develops. Um, he was coming on and playing pretty well in that, in that reserve role last year. And, and it's just the, the, the constant churn, you know, you, you can't keep everybody. And I, I, I think that the, the talk is that, yes, you need to give Logan Wilson a, a long-term deal, but I, he's the guy where I think, you're going to see them and him want to play a prove-it year this year on his fourth year, and I, I don't think you're going to see them offer him a long-term extension this year. Wait and see how the fourth year goes, and then he could possibly be a guy that they think about franchising tag. But even then, that's that would be tough to do because when you talk about the franchise tag, for I talked about wide receiver, how, how high that number is. Linebacker is actually a higher number than wide receiver because that includes those edge rushers like TJ yeah. Watt, the guys that are really defensive ends that are making tons of money. And that's what the franchise tag is based on is the average of the top five salaries. So um, it, it there it's just a, like I said, a kick the can down the road kind of thing. See how Logan Wilson plays this year. See how Akeem Davis Gaither evolves. See if you draft a, a rookie who really comes in and plays well, and they're just kind of delaying that decision. I don't, I don't necessarily that they think that Logan Wilson's up here and and Jermaine Pratt's down here. It's just a matter of this is where we're at right now. We have other decisions to make. It's a hard, it's a hard thing to do to part with Jermaine Pratt because they love him, but it's a it's a decision a, a game where you have to make hard decisions. Um, uh, Jesse Bates is a younger man. Uh, he mm -hmm. makes a lot more money than Von Bell. Von Bell's an incredible leader. There's no debate about that. Um, somebody from The Athletic, and I'm drawing a blank on who wrote the piece, thought it wasn't, uh, you know, and he, he's really an outlier in this whole debate, suggesting for a second that Jesse Bates has a chance to come back to the Bengals. Uh, Bates and Bell, what would you put their percentages on being back in a Bengals uniform next year? Um, probably five percent for Bates, and maybe that's being generous. And then Von Bell, uh, 75 80 percent. Okay, um, people forget he's been around for a long time. He's on, he's at the end of his second contract, he's still only 28. You know, the, the Bengals aren't going to pay guys that are over 30 anymore. They they learned their less, they got burned on Carlos Dunlop and Geno Atkins with that. So, what Von Bell means, what his age, and just the fact that. I don't think he's going to command a ton of money. And then you throw in the fact, too, that if you let Von Bell go, it's Dax Hill and Brandon Wilson are your safeties. You cannot go into the season, and maybe they draft a couple. Well, they would draft a couple if that were the case. You can't go into the, the season with that. He, he's too important of a piece. And I just – I think there's nothing that's a lock, but I just – it feels almost like it's a done deal. Von Bell loves it here. The team loves him, voted him a captain. His first year here voted him a captain. Um, 
he's really played well. Um, that that first year here, he was a, he was a bit of a liability in coverage against tight ends. He's gotten better at that. I just think he means way too much to this franchise for them to let him get away. Okay, last thing I want to ask you about. You talked about you know, we've talked a little bit here. Uh, we haven't gotten into the wide receiver conversation much. Um, outside of Chase and Higgins and, 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 and the money they're going to be getting, whether it's this year, the next year, the next year, et cetera. Um, in your piece today in theathletic.com, um, you know, you, you addressed the tight end situation where they don't have a tight end under contract looking ahead to next year. If they get to the 28th pick in the draft and we know everything we know about the Bengals, okay, where they are, and, and we don't know the borough contract, but what we know about the team, strengths, weaknesses, needs, et cetera. If they got to the 28th pick and you had um, Michael Mayer, tight end out of Notre Dame, or the tight end out of Georgia, uh, you know, one of the, the, a guy like that, but Mayer specifically, people are familiar mm-hmm. with him, a local kid, Notre Dame, big star, et cetera, et cetera. Jackson Smith and Jigba who was the best receiver in college football on paper going into the year this year, basically missed the whole year. But many people feel like this guy is going to be a major star if healthy. But he wasn't all year. Quentin Johnson out of TCU, phenomenally talented player, right? So if you have the choice of, and I'm getting long-winded here, forgive me. If, 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 If you were sitting there and you had to make a prediction, the Bengals at 28 have the option of, Mayor, um, I'm not going to say Paris Johnson because I think he's going to be gone. But let's say yeah. Dewan Jones and then Jackson Smith and Jigba or Johnson. What do you think they do? Whew. I mean, Quentin Johnson is uh, – um, I don't think he has any chance of being there either. I think he's going to be the top receiver off the board. And he is that that guy, kind of the T. Higgins mode, the, the big, strong, deep threat, not necessarily a burner. Uh, he would be that ideal succession plan um and i guess if he's there the questions would be why is he still there because there's there's probably gonna be a red flag somewhere that crap crops up um i don't know i i love the idea of michael Mayer because the hometown connection i think he's exactly what this offense could use with a a a really good pass catching tight end um i i kind of have a feeling they're gonna bring back hurst if they don't bring back hurst um, that that complicates this. I guess I would need to know that to, to make this call. But um, yeah, and not knowing the medicals on Leo, it's a hard decision. I, I'm glad yeah. I'm not an NFL GM. I love Njigba because we, we talked about Chase and talked about Higgins. The, the other thing that's out there is Tyler Boy is getting old and hit, getting older. Let's not say he's not old yet. He's still 28. Very good receiver, but his con his his salary cap hit is getting higher and higher and higher. And can you imagine putting in, 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 Smith and Jigba in the slot with Higgins and Chase on the outside? It wouldn't matter who you had at tight end. Um, so I, this is tough, Tom. This is I really know tough. It is. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this is the stuff that makes it fun. I mean, because if, you if, know, if Johnston's there, Johnston's the guy. And then if it's those other ones, I'm just, I just, I'm not sure about Dewan Jones yet at 28. I, I would probably go Smith and Jigba. I just, I, that is such an incredible alert to have those three receivers yeah. there, and it makes it easier to, to kind of make the call on on Higgins after this year. Um, so yeah, I, and even though I went to OU. I, I do cheer for the Buckeyes as well, so it would be fun to see uh, Jackson here. It would. Uh, he's such an incredible player. People forget that Rose Bowl he had uh, a year ago, oh, yeah. which was just, wow. I mean, one of the best games all time in the history of football, college football, by a wide receiver. All right, uh, Jay, we can't thank you enough for uh, making the time for us here today. Sure. And uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you again. All right. All right. Thanks, Tom. Good talking to all you. All right. You too. Jay Morrison, kind enough to join us today from The Athletic.